Hello and welcome to the Moz Talk podcast. This is Connor O'Boyle. Today I'll be speaking with Nan Schwartz. Nan is a composer, arranger, producer, and conductor. She has seven Emmy nominations, multiple Grammy nominations, and one win for her arrangement of Natalie Cole's Here's That Rainy Day. We hit topics like her background in music, her approach to composition, arranging and orchestration, her take on the music industry and the changes that have happened during her career. We talk about the role of the composer in filmmaking and how she paved the way for young aspiring female composers and much more. So without further delay, I give you Nan Schwartz. Okay, I am here with Nan Schwartz. Thanks for coming on the podcast, Nan. So I just would like you to introduce yourself and kind of give us some background as to uh, who you are and what you do. Okay. Uh, my name is Nan Schwartz, and I do a multitude of things in music or have. I started out as an arranger, and then I became a TV composer and have semi seven Emmy nominations to my credit for my composing in television. And I have also done a lot of arranging over the years and I have five Grammy nominations and one Grammy win for my arrangement of Here's That Rainy Day for Natalie Cole. And I'm also a songwriter. I've been producing a Latin singer and I do a live act and I conduct and orchestrate films. And last but not least, or what I can think of at the moment is that I'm writing a a Broadway bound musical. So I'm doing all the songs for that. And that's what I'm doing at the moment. Right. So that's, uh, that's definitely, um, uh, an eclectic uh, range of diverse and interesting uh, skill sets. So uh, I hope that we can definitely get into uh, some, if not if not most, of, of those different aspects of your your uh, toolkit, as it were. Um, so, but before we before we start talking about your your um, specific skills and the skills that you have that uh, make you extremely unique and and uh, successful in these different. Areas. I would like to kind of go back and, and kind of paint a, a larger picture of the the sort of um, what led you to to this point that you have such a, a diverse skill set. So can you kind of walk us through maybe like your education or your background and how you how you came to to do what you do? Sure. I grew up in a very musical family. My father comes out of the big band era. He played the lead clarinet in Glenn Miller's band and sort of created the Glenn Miller sound with the clarinet lead over the saxophones, uh, achieved fame at a very early age. And my mother uh, concurrently sang with Tommy Dorsey as one of the sentimentalists, had several hit records with him. Um, Both my parents came out to L.A. after uh, they were successful in New York to try to be in the studios, actually my dad. And um, he ended up becoming a very active studio musician, playing on records and films and TV and every Frank Sinatra record practically uh, with Nelson Riddle, Billy May, Gordon Jenkins. He's on all of those. I can still hear him when I hear those, hear that music today. My mom thought she was going to retire and ended up getting sort of drafted to become a studio singer because she was such a good sight reader and blender. And she had an equally successful career as a studio singer. And uh, so that's the kind of environment I grew up around, this great, ter- terrific success of my parents. I started out as a singer as a kid and uh, had uh, good success with that because I could sight read also. And I was in demand and I bought my first car at 16 with cash that I had earned singing. And But then there came a time around the age of 16, 17, 18, where I had to think about a career path and I wasn't interested in singing and I found the vocal parts pretty dull, dull for me. And I um, wasn't a good enough pianist. I had been playing piano my whole life, but I wasn't good enough to really want to pursue that. And I wasn't the kind of person that sat in a room and practiced for eight hours a day. So I just ruled it out, got a degree in TV production, graduated, went out to work in TV production, was working my way up that ladder when I broke my leg skiing in nine places. I'm sorry. I broke it in five places and I was laid up for nine months. I couldn't get out of bed for nine months. And so I was out of work, of course, and I was uh, bored. And I started fooling around writing vocal arrangements because my family sang and um, I didn't uh, need to get to the piano because I had perfect pitch. So that kind of fun. And then when I was able to walk around, I, I went out to lunch with a family friend. And she said to me, what's your big dream in life? Why aren't you writing some scripts to have connections in television? And I said, well, I don't have any stories to tell. And she said, well, what would you 
by doing. And I said, well, I think I would have liked to be a film composer because my hero was Johnny Mandel. Ever since I was a child, my dad uh, had played on the soundtrack, The Sandpiper, which was a very iconic soundtrack, which featured um, Jack Sheldon on trumpet playing sort of a Miles Davis kind of melody with very sophisticated jazz harmonies, but it was all orchestral. It made a big impact on me. And I think I wanted, I told her that day, that's what I would have liked to do, but it's too late. I'm a woman. I have already gone to college. There aren't any women doing this. And she said to me, why don't you study privately? And why don't you become the first woman? So I got fired up with that conversation. And I went out and found a teacher and started studying orchestration and film composing and arranging and anything and kind of crammed everything into, you know, a couple of years of study. And within a period of time, I was ghostwriting for other composers in town and eventually was given my own show to score and off and running. Okay, wow. So that's a, uh, a very um, rapid um, walk through a very, very interesting uh, youth, I suppose. Um, so it was, it was almost a, a complete act of... Uh, misfortune that led to such a fortunate career i guess do, do you think that had you not yes absolutely yeah that had you not um broken your leg that you might have continued down the the writing route and do you think um you think you would have seen that to the end or do you think you would have always gravitated back towards music <laughs> it's hard to say you know mm -hmm. of course if it's one's destiny you figure it'll somehow it will happen yeah. eventually some other way but but also i do very much feel that that accident stopped me in my tracks. And I was on the fast track of uh, TV production. I was working all the time and the money was great and I was going from job to job. And so I don't think one ever stops to really reevaluate when they're on a roll. Yeah, so I don't know if it would have happened. Uh, but it was des definitely a, a great, no pun intended, break for me because it did <laughs> put me on a different path and one that I'm so much happier doing. Sure. Um, okay, so you, you you were saying that um, you grew up in a, in a musical family and that you have um, you know inherent musical skills as a result of that. You know, you, you mentioned things like perfect pitch and uh, the ability to sight sing extremely well, and like these skills are extremely um, unique and highly highly specialized. Do you think that growing up with um, you know music in the house was it was almost second nature to you or were you uh, encouraged, uh, actively encouraged by your parents to uh, study music and to kind of pursue mu music uh, actively? Well, uh, certainly they were happy that I was studying piano and that mm -hmm. I was singing and that, you know, I was musical. I don't think my dad particularly wanted me to go into music. And in fact, when I did inform him that I was going to go down this path uh, after a while, you know, when I had made that decision, he kind of tried to talk me out of it and said, why would you want to do that? You're in line to be that producer person that signs the checks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he was more interested in the security and the business aspects of uh, the, the TV production business. Right. My mother, my mother was my biggest fan and still is. And she just thought I've got to uh, follow my heart. And, and in fact, when I did break my leg and I, it, before I actually made that decision to pursue writing, I thought I wanted to be a singer, but I didn't know what kind. And mm -hmm. so my mom would drive me around to, to vocal lessons and I didn't have the, I didn't have the actress qualities to be a soloist. And I was bored with the group singing and I just didn't, couldn't find my place at all, but she just wanted me to find, find my passion. So mm -hmm. she was very supportive. I'd like to add, though, what, what my parents really did give me, in addition to the genetic things of perhaps the perfect pitch and all that, yeah. was that they played great music in our house. Yeah, that, that actually leads me on to the next question, whereas I was wanting to touch on what your influences were. Um, obviously, they, they kind of change over time, but um, in those early years, you know, you, what, what would you say was, had the most impact on your musical um, language? Well, there was one album in particular that I remember listening to all the time called Bill Evans with Symphony Orchestra. Mm -hmm. And it was the great Bill Evans, jazz pianist, who I actually at the time was playing out of his piano transcription books. So I was already a big fan of his. 
And then um, a gentleman by the name of Klaus Ogerman, who was a wonderful arranger, uh, had written these arrangements around these pieces that Bill had played. And the pieces were classical pieces by like Scriabin, Chopin, Mm -hmm. Ravel, and, you know, a couple originals in there. And he would set up the song in a classical way. And then Bill would improvise and then the orchestra would come in and sort of a, you know, a different interpretation. And it was just so original to me. And it sort of, I just sort of always wanted to do that, I think. Right, right. And were you were, were you listening to like pop records as well at the time, jazz records? Like, you know, obviously being... Uh, young and having you know we, we, it's difficult for uh young people today to kind of gauge and, and and bring ourselves back to the world that once was you know where you had to wait for the record to come out and then you had a you know it was more of a a case of buying one record and then listening to that record repeatedly as opposed to listening to a single or you know something on on a playlist that we that we kind of consume music today in that way so you had that one record but was there any other records that you kind of remember listening to over and over again um certainly i was as much of a teenager as anybody else sure. and I was into the I was into the pop music of the day, which was the Beatles, but I was into other sophisticated stuff like Steely Dan. Mm-hmm. And um, there was a guy named Gino Vanelli, who was a singer from Canada that did all this rock and roll, but great chords, you know. And right. then, of course, and then the side groups that I followed fervently were like Sergio Mendes in Brazil '66 and uh, Jobim, and that just uh became part of my vocabulary as well because that that brazilian thing has always been a big part of mm-hmm. my uh passion yeah i imagine the the latin influences in in los angeles were definitely kind of very present you know i've you, you've people like leonard bernstein and those types of kind of mid 20th century american composers that uh, incorporated those those latin rhythms into their music as well um you know so uh Let's let's kind of move more now to uh, your sort of uh, um, compositional uh, when you you've you've broken your leg and you've made that choice and you're starting to move now into uh, more of a a architectural um, role as opposed to the you're you're more designing the the music and and being creative in that way. Um, so tell me a, about. Uh, your experiences in 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 the arranging world and and how you take another person's work and you create your own sort of touches and how you interpret uh, that in and create something that's cohesive and, and it has your personality and still has their kind of you know signature sound on it. Well, as I mentioned the other night at the ASMAC thing, I certainly wrote my share of just standard arrangements that were sort of the expected thing to do early on in my career. But as I advanced in um, in my own career and in my own personality and in working with different people, I was given the freedom to start expressing myself more. And um, so uh, I would say that um, I always want to tell a story and I always want to bring something new to the song that hasn't been done before. You know, most of these songs that get arranged are standards. They're, they're from the great American songbook and people have heard them over and over and over again. And the last thing I want to do is write an arrangement that sounds like it'd be played at, you know, by some sort of combo band at a wedding or a bar mitzvah. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So you are always thinking about new textures and new timbres and new colors, right? These are the kind of, you're always thinking about how can I reinterpret this this progression or this this um, you know melodic line so that it, it has a, a new sense of, a new, like a new personality almost. Um, can you can you can we get a little bit deeper into the the sort of methodologies that you employ the techniques? So, say for example, you are given a, a call tomorrow and they're saying we want you to arrange you know uh, this song and. What would your starting point be? Would you go back and listen to the original version, or would you would you listen to several versions of it? Well, what would your kind of your comes or your process be there? 
Well, of course, of course, it first depends on the artist and depends on what kind of ears they have. And fortunately, I've been able to work with some really great singers who have great ears and they don't need you to point out the melody within the orchestra mm-hmm. and you can kind of go off the reservation a little bit and come back and they are happy to have something you know, unique and, and they don't feel threatened by it. There are some singers that would feel threatened by it. They just mm-hmm. want to hear some pads behind them and right. they, they don't want anyone, anything to take the focus off of them. Mm-hmm. But um, I, I would like to say that uh, sort of a pivotal point in my arranging approach came when I was hired by a trumpet player in Germany named Till Broner. And he had been uh, asked to produce a record by a jazz singer named Mark Murphy. And he approached me and said, could you just add some strings to this? And I listened to the track and I was just pretty much blown away with it. First of all, it was just Mark Murphy, who I wasn't even familiar with, but he was a wonderful jazz stylist. It was him and it was a German pianist named Frank Chastanier. And Frank is sort of the Bill Evans of Europe. Right. Just so sensitive and just plays the the greatest stuff. And that was all that was on the track. There were, and there was a, some trumpet fills by Till, because he's a trumpet player. Um, but that was all that there was. And it really taught me that all the harmony was in the piano, and all the interesting stuff was already there. Mm. And all I needed to do was sort of color it. And it made me start thinking very linearly right. and start creating lines in the strings instead of writing chords and trying to duplicate what what the piano was doing i just kind of circled around the piano and and kind of drew wisps of color around the piano in linear lines kind of coming in and out Mm -hmm. and i'm pretty proud of those records i still get a lot of uh mail about those we did two records one's called once to every heart and the second one is called love is what stays and on that second one i had a bigger orchestra to work with but still, it was the same kind of concept where I wanted to stay out of the way of the, the great Frank Chastanier. Right. And so that that sort of established a – out of that, I sort of felt like, oh, I think I have a personality. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm, I'm writing in a different way than other people are. And I think I'm going to keep doing this because I really like the results. And, um, and sort of with that – with those two records – sort of defining who I was, I started to get phone calls for people from people that asked me to do more of that. Yeah. So obviously this is um, before modern technology and things. Um, so you, you didn't have your Sibeliuses and, and, and that type of stuff. So this was all done pencil and paper, right? Well, no, actually uh, that I mean, I do do I do work in pencil and paper because I do like to sketch out stuff. But yeah. with that record in particular, I probably just inputted the audio into my sequence, and hearing that those strings and the voice, I just started coloring around it. Okay, so you you are most certainly kind of that old school tradition where you you like to sit at a at a table with pencil and paper and you like to, um, you know, start from, from a sketch and then expand to what will ultimately be your fully realized orchestral version, um, gradually, right? Well, not on every chart, uh, on a chart where I have to start from nothing and a blank page. Yes. That's the way I like to work. That just creates an extra step for myself because eventually I'll have to put it into some sort of sequence and do a demo because people seem to like demos now. Um, or I'll, And I'll have to put it in finale because everyone needs a finale score now. And, and I have to create my own parts now, which was not anything we used to do. We used to just turn in the score to the copyist. But now, uh, so I've created an extra step for myself in doing the pencil and paper thing. But I value it because it gives me a chance to work out my ideas. But, you know, if it's some sort of groove track where I'm sweetening it, you know, I'm not going to probably sketch. I'm probably going to go directly to uh, the sequence and start fooling around with it. And then if I need to work anything out, I'll go over to the piano and write a few bars down so that I have something to play. Right. And is this this process kind of similar across the board of all of your like so if you're if you're composing as opposed to arranging, 
Is your process similar or do you have a different methodology for when you're writing your own compositions? Everything's different. Right. I mean, the, the piece on my album called Angels Among Us it has a lot of minimalism in it. And that I could write till I was blue in the face, but I wouldn't really get the sense of what it sounded like. So that's stu- the kind of stuff I would input into my computer mm-hmm. so that I could get those notes going and then feel like I, I knew what was happening and write around it. Right. I'm, I'm trying to get at how you conceptualize music in your own mind. So every everything that you work on, everything that you that you're that you're focusing your attention on is has a different um, process behind it. You don't have one sort of locked in methodology that you repeat over and over again. It's very it's very fluid and flexible. Is that kind of more accurate to say? I would I would say that I would say that I would say that possibly in arranging because it's shorter a shorter piece of music. I might sketch the whole thing out first on paper like I did with Here's That Rainy Day. Mm-hmm. I took it eight bars at a time, and I didn't know where I was going with it. And I sort of charted the whole thing out, did the whole sketch. Then I c- committed it to whatever demo I was doing or, or finale or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, in the case of my orchestral works, the bigger ones, um, uh, I the, the Angels Among Us, I, I inputted music into a sequencer, you know, as I was going, I didn't know where I was going with it, but I would then I would listen back and hear where I was and where I wanted to go from there. Right. Um, I, I would like to add one little methodology tip that I use when I'm arranging, and that is when I'm doing a song that has been done so many times before, that a standard from the Great American Songbook, let's say. Mm-hmm. I like to go on iTunes and I like to listen to all 100 versions of it, not the whole thing, but two bars. And I go down the list of all the versions and I go, oh, that sucks. I don't want to, I don't want to do that. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. That's a dumb idea. Oh, you know, and I just, it serves a purpose for me to fire me up, to make right. me want to do something completely different and certainly not. Uh, I mean, you'll notice from here's that rainy day that I didn't even bring in the rhythm section until, you know, halfway through the tune. Yeah. I mean, uh, I have I've listened to it a f- several times since since they played it on Monday and it's uh, my my instant reaction to to hearing that is is the not 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 only the co- the cohesiveness of it all but uh, it was the coloring it was the it was the the the, the voicings of the of the chords and where the colors are are so elegantly placed that that's something that I that I really picked up on, really enjoyed, and obviously all the comments that that were made on on the evening, um, about the the transitions and uh, moving from from the 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 parts with vocal to the parts without vocal. But for me, it it was your instrumentation choices I thought were very very interesting. Can can you speak a little bit about how you how it were orchestrations as opposed so we're we're talking about how you distribute uh the voicings amongst the the ranges of the instruments and how you think about the colors in that way um it's hard to say if i was thinking about the instrumentation as i was arranging that i think i was probably sketching that at the piano and i got the voicings i wanted and then i figured out who was going to play that Mm -hmm. so i'm not sure except for that one little oboe line at the very intro where he's just jumping up an octave and holding a note that's a very oboistic thing to do yeah okay so, so so again you it's this is more of a kind of just an instinctual thing that you kind of ah, oh, this is gonna that'll be nice on the clarinets oh that'll be great in the strings there and you just it's more of a it's a it's more of a, mm, a gut feeling as opposed to sort of oh, okay i'm gonna write this out and i'm gonna you know methodically think about where the where the the kind of ranges of the instruments sit in terms of low to high, it's more of like in a oh I feel that that's really going to be nice in the oboe. Yeah, I think that's more of the case. I'm I'm very instinctive about mm. what I do. It's I just get an idea and I try to go with it. Okay, so let's uh, let's move to to what you what what was played on at the ASMAC event on 
on Monday night, some of the some of the really beautiful music um, that you have. So, can you walk us through this this latest project of yours? Not the uh, the musical, but the the, one, the latest project that's been released. Um, uh, no, I would. I'm 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 sorry, I didn't even mention that in that paragraph when I was talking about all the different hats I wear because that certainly is something I'm super proud of that I was able to get those pieces finished and and recorded. Mm -hmm. um, I was approached by, well, actually, I had written Angels Among Us, and I had done a synth demo on it with orchestral samples, and then I got a live trumpet player to play on it, Wayne Bergeron, who's just great. And I started sending it around to people to see if I could get some interest, either in recording it, performing it, something. And it came to the attention of a conductor in Australia named Kevin Purcell. And he said, this is great. What else have you got? And I said, well, I have three other pieces, actually only two. Um, the other, the, the fourth one I wrote later on. Um, I, and so I played those for him and he liked those as well. And he said, I, I'd like to do an album with you. He was interested in kind of showcasing his work as a conductor and he wanted to champion a new composer that hadn't been recorded. So he picked me and the first piece on the album is something I wrote um, early in my career for an organization called the New American Orchestra, which was sort of a hybrid thing, which used the L.A. studio musicians of the day who doubled on everything and played jazz. And they wanted a they wanted pieces there that were kind of symphonic jazz mm -hmm. style that I think the, the term that was coined many years ago by Gunther Schuller is third stream, which means, you know, a, a blend of these two elements. And I was sort of the perfect person because I was into the orchestra and I was into jazz. Um, and so they commissioned me to write a piece and I did that and it was performed live. Um, but I had a kind of a uh, poor recording of the rehearsal. even It wasn't even the recording. Uh, I mean, it wasn't even recorded at the event because they never did get a good recording. So I didn't have a great recording, and that was the first piece, and Kevin wanted to record that. And the second piece was done um, several years later. I was commissioned by now the Mancini Institute Orchestra, which was a similar uh, type of orchestra, but these were all young musicians that were in their early 20s that were learning how to uh, navigate all the kinds of music that you do when you're a studio player mm -hmm. and I wrote a piece for them and conducted it and in concert and got a recording of that but it was just a live recording so that was the second piece and then of course Angels Among Us which was the piece that Kevin had heard and then there was a fourth piece which I can tell you about if you'd yeah. like yeah yeah it's called Romanza and it's uh I had it's an interesting story about this because he had asked me, Kevin had asked me to write like another 13 minutes. He needed to fill up the album. And I had written a piece and I had sketched the whole thing out and I was getting ready to orchestrate it. And uh, my heart wasn't in it. I just couldn't mm. get behind it. It didn't feel like me. Right. It didn't feel like it was sort of... Can, can you just stop and, and kind of articulate that? Because it, I think that's that's something that's quite common amongst composers i know i've gotten you know two or three minutes into in the music and pieces that i've been writing and and just you know i've had that same feeling of uh i just don't love this you know so you know what what was that sort of process like how, how far did you did you get into your your creative process before you kind of decided uh this is not this is not what i want it to be well, I got all the way to the end of the sketch. I mean, it was right. it was a completed piece. It's still sitting up on my piano, and I'm mm -hmm. I'm reluctant to throw it in the trash because <laughs> right. it's a lot of work. It was a lot of work, right? And yet, my heart wasn't in it because it didn't feel like it was coming from me. It felt like I was trying to fulfill a purpose, and um, and it felt like. It just didn't feel me. Right. I don't know how to say it better than that. Yeah. So what I did was I called my husband, Conrad Pope, who's a famous orchestrator and yeah. composer and whose opinion I greatly respect. And he yeah. was out of the country 
And I told him what I was feeling and I fully expected him to say, uh, come on, buck up, finish the thing, get, get it done. You know, you'll, you'll get into it. And much to my surprise, he said, then don't finish it. Uh, put it aside and write something else that you really like. And that was very interesting to hear that. And I was so glad he gave me permission because I stopped it and I went off and said, I really want to write something that's just really beautiful to me. Mm -hmm. And that's when I wrote Romanza, which just really came from my heart. Yeah, Romanza is a really beautiful piece and it's on uh, YouTube. There's a video, right, of it being conducted yeah. in, in Vienna. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so definitely if, if you want to check that piece out, um, it's a really wonderful uh, wonderful music that's been um, recorded at the Synchron stage, am I right, in, in Vienna? Yes. Yeah, uh -huh. it's a wonderful room, uh, famous for the um, the sample libraries, the, the Synchron uh, Vienna Pro um, sample libraries. Okay, so th that's really wonderful. And so this album is available uh, on iTunes and, and Spotify. It's available to, uh, to listen to right now, right? Yeah, it's available on Divine Art Records, which is the label it's on and they have all kinds of formats for it you can get a cd you can get a high def mm -hmm, version mm -hmm. you can get various things you can also get it on amazon right right uh, and it's just the, the title is just nan schwartz in case you're looking for it that's all it is just my name just your name okay um so can we pivot now to your um so this is this is the concert world i want to kind of pivot to to your film work um because these are very similar but distinct differences in in writing and i think getting how composers um respond to um stimuli that's not necessarily subjective um in the sense that it's not coming entirely from you um but you're reacting to something else that's stimulating you i would like to know how do you think about fellow music or, or visual media and how do you kind of go about working in that sort of space as opposed to your writing for just strict concert work? Well, obviously there's some big constraints there. There's, there's the dialogue, there's the mm -hmm. director, there's the um, genre, there, there's the budget. There's all these different things that give you I don't want to say limitations, but they sort of do give you, put you in a box of right. uh, finding your way through to be creative in, in spite of different things. And the first thing you have to think about is what's the director looking for and what are they tempted with? Mm -hmm. What are they, and you hope that they hired you because they want something you can bring to it. But sometimes it's not always the case. Yeah. Sometimes they just want you to, you know, mimic what is tempting, right? So um, right. you're like a cheaper version of the, the main composer or the songwriter that was originally there in the first place. Um, how, how do you deal with temp music? Do you do you like it? Do you not like it? I mean, I know there's there's very, very kind of mixed feelings about that. And a lot of people tend to not like it. I I don't mind it. I like to know what they're listening to and what they're thinking about. Mm -hmm. It gives me a starting place and it gives me, I like to say, what is it that you like about this? Right. You know, maybe it's just the rhythm or maybe it's just the instruments mm -hmm. or maybe it's just who knows what it is. It, it could be something that we as musicians don't even uh, aren't even sensitive to right i mean when you when you're speaking with directors obviously they're not most of them aren't very musically um literate not not, not literate but they it's very difficult for them to articulate themselves in precise conceptual ways so they have to resort to kind of language it's a little bit kind of abstracted so they might speak in in colors or they might speak in in textures this type of thing so how do you deal with um kind of translating or, or, or extracting those musical ideas from like what they like about the tent music or what they like about your music and how do you engage with them on, in that way well you engage with them by being as patient as you can and trying to read between the lines of what they're saying and mm. And the temp, that's where the temp track does come in, because at least it's giving you some sort of musical uh, jumping off point. Right. Because sometimes, as, as Conrad likes to say, 
his job is to guess the comp- uh, guess the director's favorite color. You know, <laughs> right. It's like so vague. How could you possibly read their mind? Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. and it's it's difficult. So you have to have a lot of patience, and you have to be a good collaborator, and be willing to go back and forth. And um, and I'm dealing with that right now with my musical, and that writing something and having the director say, or the, the producer in this case saying, well, that's not what I had in my head. Mm. Well, how do I know what you have in your head? You know? <laughs> right. Right. And do you find that writing for, for a uh, musical is, is similar in many ways to writing for, for TV or film? Well, no, because the, I am writing songs, right? Of course. Songs have a different structure. Film, film and TV cues are, not necessarily they don't have a beginning middle and end they are just bo- supposed to mm-hmm. sort of evoke an emotion that or uh um care reflect something that's happening on screen which could change on a dime you know yeah yeah so it's a different skill set right i know that um a lot of composers are very sort of well i i i th- had conversations where people are saying that the the old Hollywood sensibility has sort of vanished from from Hollywood and from LA. The, this idea of, of of melody and and kind of modulation and harmony and uh, composers knowing and having the the freedom to um, develop their ideas throughout the entirety of a film. Um, you know, and I know Chris Young is extremely kind of very much uh, adamant that melody should always have um, very high importance in your music, and he's very much in that school of thinking. What 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 are your ideas in in terms of um, obviously you grew up in that period with with the Alfred Newmans and and the um, you know the I'm not that old, but okay. Well, they, <laughs> but they they were there. You know, the, you had the 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 presence was was very much um, still alive. That that idea of of that music should be uh, music in a film, whereas today that seems to have sort of diminished slightly. What are your thoughts on that? Let's put it this way. When I was growing up and listening and buying soundtracks, by the way, which I have not done in, you know, years Mm -hmm. because there's nothing I want to own. Right. Um, The people I was listening to were Dave Brewson, Johnny Mandel, Johnny Williams, John Mm -hmm. Williams, (laughs) Jerry Goldsmith, Elmer Bernstein. These guys were great composers and great, melodists and very unique in their styles and yes i agree there's been a total decline in film music and i'm i'm not really a fan of it anymore it's it's pretty sad i hope that um i hope the tide turns and i hope young directors coming up want to um, reverse the trend mm, mm-hmm. i think it's really up to the directors because i've heard that the the mantra now is no melody and yeah. And they just want ambience, and it's become sound design. Mm-hmm, and that's mm-hmm. pretty sad because uh, we've got all this creative musical talent out here, and it's sort of going to waste. Right. Do you think that the um, the rise of, of samples and the rise of synth uh, mock-ups and demos was the kind of the, the main contribution to that? Or do you think that it was just a, a reaction to what was then perceived to be old? I think both. I mm. think everybody's always trying to come up with some new thing, the new flavor of the month, and they don't want to be defined by something that happened in the past. And so it's a new sound. And certainly there are certain composers in town that have become hugely successful with that kind of um, paradigm of, Stadium rock music, where the, you know, the violins play the, uh, are, are the lead guitar, and the violas are the rhythm guitar, and, you know, it's just like rock and roll, but realized in the orchestra. Um, so let's, uh, let's move, uh, I would like to talk about um, your uh, musical a little bit more. If, can you talk about the musical, or is, is it um, still kind of under wraps? It's still under wraps as far as the title and the and the subject matter. Right. I mean, I can talk about that process, but um. Yeah, let's. But, uh, uh, can, we, can we talk about the the process of of writing for for a stage? I mean, 
Um, do you have a, like a cast in mind or do you have, are you writing for specific singers or what was that kind of process like? Well, it, right now we're in the process of um, putting a demo together that is going to go out to the backers, the potential backers, the investors, the people that are going to come on board and, and get this thing to the next level. So it's been a matter of the producer selecting certain scenes from the musical and saying, write a song that, uh, in, in that goes here. And so I've done several different styles. One is a waltz, one is a tango, one is a, uh, electronica, one is a, um, kind of an orchestral dance that I had to write a la Leonard Bernstein. And so there've been so many different kind of styles and I've really enjoyed the challenge of that. Um, no particular singer in mind. My, my melodies are fairly tricky sometimes, but fortunately the talent pool in LA of singers is so great that I haven't had any complaints and everybody, you know, learns their music and comes in and nails it. And I've actually been singing on some of my own demos just to give them. So that's been fun for me. Yeah, I remember that you spoke um, about, and I think you mentioned it, um, you know, not too long ago in this conversation. But you mentioned that your your attitude towards singing was revitalized only recently. Uh, you yeah. said you said that you kind of had a, a sort of um, a, you became you know dissatisfied with with the writing or with the the what was expected of singers. Um, so now that you're writing your own. Uh, vocal lines in your own. I remember you specifically, you, you mentioned that you didn't like singing in unison. Um, so I'm, yeah. I'm thinking, how, how, are you, how are you approaching writing for voice um, on this project? Well, th- it's two different, two different things. When I was singing, and if I were singing today, I was in a, singing in a group. So yes, I would say when they have people singing in groups and, and also in films too, you know, most often they they write pretty boring vocal parts. It's usually two-part harmony or mm-hmm. unison. The, the things I'm writing are soloistic lines that are melody lines for, you know, knockout singers. Mm. And um, so I'm just trying to write interesting melodies. And I'm not necessarily thinking too much about the singer. I I don't want to write anything too rangy or difficult, but... I'm writing stuff that I hear in my mind and they're, they are able to do it, you know, right. such as like Leonard Bernstein would do or Stephen Sondheim would do. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And um, so it's, it's for soloists and is there a, is there a, um, a chorus involved as well? Are you writing for, for chorus? Well, at the moment, uh, the, the demos I've done have, have been, the songs I've done have been, you know, two or three or four characters singing lines and, or, and sometimes singing together. And this last one that I've done, uh, which hasn't been recorded yet, but there's going to be some parts, some vocal parts where they all sing together on the chorus. So Mm -hmm. there's that, but there's individual lines as well. So just, um, I want to pivot because you, you mentioned, um, at the beginning of the conversation that, um, you had sort of preconceptions about, um, going into to music, um, you said, oh, I've already got my, my um, degree in, in film or in TV production or writing um, and that you were a woman, right? This was something that, that you said um, was a barrier to entry, um, what, you, what you thought was a barrier to entry and most likely was at the time. Um, it's, it's, it's one of the most amazing uh, achievements out of all of the amazing achievements that you were able to achieve everything that you did. Um, so can you kind of um, talk about, because I know that a lot of, um, I'm, I'm trying to, to engage uh, with as many sort of viewpoints as possible as well. So um, I was speaking to other female composers like uh, Imer Nun and, um, you know, these types of people. Uh, who are considered to be very successful in their field. So Emer is a, uh, uh, a games composer, um, and she's you know famous for uh, Minecraft, World of Warcraft. Sorry, um, you know. So uh, what what is it? Can you talk about your experience and how perceptions are changing uh, in relation to female composers? 
Well, let me back up and just tell you that when I started, even though it seemed daunting because there were no role models, mm. it was a different landscape and there really wasn't discrimination. It wasn't that it wasn't that women were being discriminated against. It's that no women were trying to even do it. Right, right. They hadn't they hadn't considered doing it. But when I decided I wanted to do it, I found a lot of receptive executives and people that were hiring composers very willing to listen to my demo tapes. Hmm. And frankly, at the time, because it was before the advent of the computer um, and demos, uh, we were called upon to create a score in about five days and show up five days later and conduct it in an orchestra. Hmm. And so it had to be right. And so there was no barriers about, well, is she a woman or is she this ethnicity or is she this or that? It's just, can you do the job? Right. And, and that eliminated a lot of people. So I was one of those people that could do the job. Mm. So I was called upon to do it. And it wasn't, I was no token woman right, right. at all. Now, flash forward to current times. Uh, I guess your question is, do I, do I find there are barriers was that the question? No, I thought that there. I thought that there may have been bar- barriers uh, at that time, but obviously you're saying that that well, that wasn't the case. It was it was more of a meritocracy where it, you know, can you do the job? Yeah, okay, go do the job. Um, but you know, there there seems to be a, a sort of a maybe it's just because it's in vogue or it's because it's um, you know it's it's a point of contention in other areas of of discipline um, that. Um, you know, that the fact that there's not, or there historically hasn't been a lot of um, famous female composers that, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, the, the scores of Rachel Portman or Mika Levy, these types of, of composers that are, that are sort of starting to make headlines around the world, you know, um, you just think that that's, do you think that, that um, we're seeing um, a period in time where the sort of, the, the balance between man and woman is more kind of is sort of reaching a status of equilibrium uh, where, you know, we might have the ratio being more kind of even 50-50. I think it's going to take a long time. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's going to happen overnight. I think some wom- woman has to break through and do a, a film that's in the genre of films that they're being that are being made, such as a superhero movie mm, or a mm. Marvel movie or a Star Wars movie. Right. And when a woman can do that, then that might open doors for that woman to do it again. Right. I'm not sure that studios having to invest so much money in these films, they're not willing to take risks on um, uh, composers that are untried. Mm-hmm. And so you see the same male composers getting these jobs over and over again. It's not easy for men coming in that are nobodies, yeah. that don't have the, the credits. So it's the same for women, except women haven't even reached that A-list thing. The mm-hmm. Rachel Portman situation is um, she did a certain type of film, kind of a female film, if you were. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not sure they're making those kinds of films as much anymore. Um, and as far as Mika Levy, she was clutched out of the, uh, the concert world. I believe mm. she, I don't think she went looking for a film scoring career. I think they found her and they, yeah. I think historically directors always want to find some new, new thing, you know, whether it's a rock band or whether it's a classical composer or, um, you know, John Carigliano scoring red violin. I mean, I'm sure he wasn't pounding the pavements trying to get uh, a film score. I'm yeah. sure they came to him and said, oh, we want a different sensibility here. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I think those are two exceptional cases. I think women have a better shot if they really want to be working. They have a be- much, much better shot working in independent films and getting credits that way. Right. And then the independent film director that moves up to the um, doing a mainstream Hollywood film financed by the studios can then take that composer with him. Yeah, I, th- I think that's kind of basically true across the board, not exclusively for women. Um, you know, I know that many people have 
um, kind of advise that, that that's the way to go. But I think we live in a period now where um, you see like with the rise of Netflix and Amazon and this type of stuff where most of the most of the kind of interesting storytellers are, are, are actually moving across to these kind of platforms because these guys tend to, uh, the Netflixes and stuff tend to, give more creative freedom than the studios would do um do you find that that's the case that obviously coming from tv do you think that tv's kind of experiencing sort of some um revolution in terms of how content has been created for it well absolutely and and that's the irony here that it is the golden age of television there's better and more television on tv than ever Mm. but sadly the, the musical question, which we talked about earlier, about the quality of music and the kind of music that they're looking for, that has changed. And mm. so you get a lot of sound design. And frankly, I see, and quite effectively, actually, I think the money is being poured into buying, um, uh, you know, buying songs. Mm. I think yeah. a lot of these a lot of these programs spend their whole budget um, on songs. Yeah, I mean the that the TV series Westworld. I don't know. I don't yeah. know if you're familiar with that, but the I think most of the soundtrack where it was the kind of um, player piano arrangements of uh, famous rock songs. Um, mm-hmm. I'm I'm almost certain that they did a Radiohead version uh, of a song in there. So. Um, yeah, that's definitely something that's that's uh, quite um, unique to. Uh, I suppose to film as well as they they rely heavily on on pop songs as well. Um, so just before I was kind of close out here, I would like you to, um, if you could, sort of what advice or knowledge or things um, that you would advise a, a, an aspiring composer or arranger or, uh, orchest- orchestrator. Um, you know, obviously there's so many ways that you can come to this. You can go, um, to Berkeley or USC or whatever and, and, and do the, the programs there, or you can kind of come from a, a rock band like your, uh, Trent Reznor's and Hans Zimmer's. Um, you know, what, what would you say would be kind of a fundamental um, thing that you would say that people would need to know to do something in, in film scoring? Well, I don't think you need to know anything, for, sadly. Right. I think all you need to know is, uh, you know, how to, how to sequence your music and, and find some samples and plug them in. But that's not the advice I'm going to give. <laughs> because I don't, want, I don't want music to deteriorate any further than it already has. Mm. So I don't want to encourage people to get away with the minimum. Right. Like, like, for instance, it's not uncommon for Conrad and I to hear in the classroom, is it necessary that I learn to read music? Yeah. And, and the answer, sadly, is no, it's not necessary. You don't, know how to, you don't need to learn how to read music. But isn't that sad that people don't want to learn what they yeah. need to know or what they should know to be musicians? Yeah, it's like an actor saying, "Do I know? Do I need to know how to read a script?" <laughs> yeah, it's like no, just get the audio book; it's fine. <laughs> yeah, right. So, but anyway, back to the advice. So, I would thoroughly encourage anyone that has any interest in co- composing or music to learn as much as you can and mm-hmm. get a good education in music. Um, the, with the fundamentals. Mm-hmm. Secondly, I would say don't get hung up on any line that you're standing in. For instance, I started this whole process wanting to write the score to the Sandpiper, which I mentioned earlier. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. Well, I could be waiting all my whole career for that and never get that phone call because A, I w- they didn't want to call me and B, they're not making those kind of films and need that kind of score anymore. Mm-hmm. So, I would say at least what, what's been a very good survival tactic for me is to try to pursue music in all different genres and different things such as orchestration, songwriting, arranging, composing, conducting, even music prep, anything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because when one area dies down, another one has got something happening and you can go over there and do that right. so that there's never a dull moment. Right, but obviously, to to do that, to have that breadth of of knowledge, you need to really 
spend the time and and work on on developing your your vocabulary as as, as we as we spoke of a lot of my contemporaries a lot of people that would be kind of around the same age as me would spend a lot of time uh, studying film scores and and looking at um, you know the scores of John Williams or or James Horner or any of those those guys that that wrote almost exclusively for orchestra. Um, how important or what would you say? Do you think it's equally as important to look at at famous uh, film scores as opposed to spending your time looking at the the great works of of um, the concert world, you know, your, your Beethovens and your Brahms and your Stravinsky's, you know, what would you say would be the, to spend your time uh, there? Well, I think, yes, you got to look beyond film scoring because that's just, those guys have actually studied all the classical scores and know that, and that's where they're coming from. Uh, you don't have to know all the classical literature, but if you can find one or two pieces that uh, resonate with you, that you love, and you can learn from those, like take Ravel or take, in my case, it's, you know, it'd be William Walton or Shostakovich or Prokofiev. You know, there's a lot of stuff there. So I would say, yes, try to learn some of those techniques and learn some of that. Just get some of that under your belt. Um, the other thing I wanted to add about for specifically for women is try to have a balanced life and don't give it, give your whole life over to this business waiting for the phone to ring. Because I, one of the best things I ever did was to decide in the midst of my success, oh, I think I better get married. You know, I think I better start thinking about this personal life thing. Otherwise it's going to pass me by. And I don't mean that you just, you know, put it on your list and check it off. Like, oh, time to find a husband. It wasn't quite like that. But, uh, you know, I, I thought it was very important to uh, have a well-balanced life, let's say. And so I did get married. And on top of that, I had four kids and have four kids. And and it's the best thing I've ever done. And yes, it was hard to juggle all of it while working. But, you know, sometimes the work slows down when the kids are young and the work speeds up when the kids don't need me so much. And it's all worked out, thankfully. But I would say that um, without family and and love around you then all of this is sort of ephemeral and and we all know that film scores unless you're going to write a masterpiece it's it's comes and goes and it and it's it lasts as long as the movie lasts and then it's over and it's not very satisfying sorry to sorry to say that but it's sort of true yeah do do you think that um just to go on, going back to things or skills that that up and coming composers uh, should have or um, would be the ability to um, convincingly um, create uh, samples, uh, orchestral demos with samples, because obviously the the, the, the chance of having uh, an orchestra play your music, um, especially if you're working on independent films, is very, very low. I mean, it is possible to go to Eastern Europe, I guess, um, but even still, I mean, if you're talking... Um, these sort of package scores where you do the you write the music and you produce the music and you dub the music essentially um, do you think that that that's a skill that should be uh, a priority in in today's world well I think technology is a whole field unto itself and in my case I've chosen to if I, if I can't afford the orchestra and I need samples and I need that kind of massaging of the samples, I go to an expert. I don't, uh, because I could spend a lifetime worrying and, and learning that uh, technique of how to make samples sound real. And I, and perhaps other people can add that to their palate quite quickly and add it to, to their composing ability, but I'd really much rather spend my time thinking about ideas and composing and music and leave the technology to other people. That doesn't mean I, I'm averse to using those samples. I'm just saying I don't want to spend all day making it sound right. Let, let someone else do that. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing. I, I, um, I, I had Chris Young on the podcast as well, and I asked him the same question. I'll, I'll ask you it now. Um, have you ever been fooled by a... A mock-up? Have you ever 
thought that it was an actual orchestra playing or, or do you always know when it's when it's not a real orchestra let's put it this way there's times when i had to say when i have said um is that real or is that memorex that, mm. that was an old that right. was an old uh ad slogan for memorex tape but the the truth is that occasionally i do get not fooled but stopped in my tracks to right. question it yeah yeah but right. i think i think there's a, an instinctive sensibility that i kind of know the difference no matter mm-hmm. how great it sounds mm-hmm I mean, but for the general for the general audience, you know, going to see the movie once and then never hearing it again, you think that the the level, the quality that we've that we've taken it to is is appropriate now? Yeah, I think that we we can do amazing things. I mean, I I don't think vocally they've replaced humans, but and I don't think woodwinds particularly sound great to me, especially like saxophones. But I think pretty much every instrument is has been fine-tuned and covered and sampled to death. And yeah, I think we can totally fool the public. And it, it, then it does come down to, you know, good writing, if, especially if it's good writing. It, you can really fool the public because it, it means you've thought about the music and voice leading and everything that you would think about if you were writing for a real player. See, what, one of the things that I've, that I've spoken to people about is this idea that um, – you your compositional ideas are influenced by your samples uh so your your composition has been are is been controlled by your ability to manipulate the samples rather That's than true. your knowledge of the orchestra so you might you might write something um that can't be played by uh, a, a, a live orchestra some people would say that that's bad writing other people would say that that's um you know the way things are like you're producing a sort of semi hybrid electronic score just using samples you know, what, what's your take on that sort of thing well i just find that when i'm writing strings and using samples i i tend to write like pads mm. because it just the 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 articulation and the uh, maybe it's just because it's too much work to find it the right sample that's the staccato sample but mm. you know i don't have the patience to go manipulate it to make it sound real so i wouldn't write it like a necessarily like a tricky moving right. staccato line in the strings i might not write that mm-hmm. I, I, and so yes it does it does affect what i would write absolutely but so i mean like this this type of thing where like, say you, if you had a student that brought um a piece to you and they had you know a uh 30 second note ostinato in the celli for 120 bars you know yeah. would you would you say something like uh eh, that's uh that's that's not gonna fly or you know that they had winds with tied whole notes for you know a minute <laughs> you know it's like a, a, a flute player can't can't uh can't hold their breath for that long i'm sorry you know would you would you point out those those um uh, performance uh, discrepancies, or or would you say? I suppose it's it's in the nature of the style, I guess. But you know, uh, I know some people are very adverse to it, and some people are very kind of open to it. So it's it's a very interesting question to ask of professionals. Well, I would I think if you want it to sound realistic, you have to think of it as a real orchestra. So if they need to take a breath, and you need to write that in there, you know, and and just to hear one long. Uh, whole note tied over many many bars is pretty boring anyway. Um, but but Conrad has an expression: you don't you're not writing for the instrument; you're writing for the person that's yeah. playing the instrument. Yeah, I've heard that. I've heard that expression. Um, yeah, it, it's it's just it's an interesting dichotomy I find between the two schools of thought. You know, you have um, the way I try to the way I try to articulate it is: you have the sort of the John Williams school, and you have that Hans Zimmer school, where you know John Williams perceives the orchestra to be the 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 summary of all the of all the the parts right so it's the 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 total of all the moving parts inside it where hans would say something like the orchestra is just a part within the larger whole but it's made up of smaller parts you know you know what i mean yes uh um so it's just interesting to to see how people can can their attitudes change in terms of the the stylistic nature of of what's been produced as a whole piece. So, I mean, if you're producing uh, an orchestral piece that's exclusively orchestra and you're doing things like tying whole notes, um, then it's it would be bad writing, I guess. But if you're doing it in the context of a larger 
thing with with your sound design and that sort of stuff then it might be a little bit more appropriate i think that's kind of my sort of take on it um i i think that's right but just remember whose music's gonna last and who's yeah yeah exactly i mean um there's only so many times you, you can hear that sort of um really low bassy heavy brass driven uh you know, well, the the thing that I that I that I hear a lot was, uh, can you sing any melody from Marvel? And the answer <laughs> probably is no, uh, yeah, because they're not there. <laughs> um, you know, so but that I was really, it was really, I really enjoyed talking to you. Um, is there anything else that you would like to discuss or or uh, mention before you go? Well, I can't think of anything, but you've been a great interviewer, and you've asked me some very interesting questions that I and gone to a depth that most don't. So I appreciate that. Yeah. And I hope I haven't been too candid. No, no, no. So this just, is uh, if anything's offensive, just cut it out. No, no, this is um this is an open platform. It's not really designed for any sort of uh you know, I, I want it to be um I want it to be a a, a place where, where ideas are presented and, and, and talked about and conversations that should be had are had, you know, that type of thing. So uh, thanks so much again for coming on the podcast. I, uh, I really appreciate you taking the time and uh, I hope we get to speak to you again soon. You too. And thanks again. Okay. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye.